Most of the time. I mean, I'm sure there were other things that we could have done which would have paid off better. We, we did, I think we did about uh, six or seven attacks on the turbines. Was, we could never see her because she was in the field covered with um, smoke canisters. But uh, the thing is, it kept the turbines in. I mean, if she'd got out, she could have done an awful lot of damage. But to us, it seemed a waste of time. For the Allies in the West, there remained one last bogey. Before the war, Hitler had launched the Tirpitz, and to him she typified power on the sea. Later, he was to change that view. With her sister ship Bismarck, she was one of the world's largest, displacing over 45,000 tons. With Tirpitz at large, a high proportion of Allied naval power had to be held in abeyance from other tasks. I mean, it was such a threat uh, to the whole of the war in that part of the world. But it was interesting that bef when we had our, our briefing, that we had uh, people from the Ministry of Warfare, I think it was called, I'm not quite certain, who came on board civilians, and they told us how very important it was uh, that, um, that we did our very best for, for the reasons that they explained, that she was tying down the home fleet and a terrific threat to the, the convoys going up there, which was certainly true, she was. So the fact that we partly crippled her was, um, uh, was very important. Well, it was the only big, big attack I ever did, really. The fleet air arm weren't very good at doing big attacks. We, most of our work was anti-submarine patrol, attacking merchant shipping here and there, just the odd one. We went up to Scapa, and we had a, a mock-up of the Turpits in Loch Erebel, I think it was. We used to do dive bombing raids on that there. Well, we were in Barracudas, which were... Uh, dive bombers and uh, reconnaissance torpedo bombers. The Barracuda, the most peculiar looking aircraft that man has ever seen, um, it looked like a Christmas tree. Uh, I had an air, a bicycle that I carried around in this country and when we were going from air station to air station I'd have it slung underneath the wing and it looked like part of the aircraft. You couldn't distinguish between a bicycle hanging from the wing and the other things hanging from the wing. It had one very major problem. The wings used to fall off. And from time to time, we'd receive an instruction, stop flying until you have further instructions. And we'd be grounded for two or three days and then we'd be allowed to fly again. The reason being, another lot of wings had fallen off somewhere in the middle of a dive bombing exercise. And I don't think they ever cured this problem. It was something to do with the belts and whatever in the aircraft. In the early spring of 1944, a large British carrier force approaches the Norwegian coast unseen. The objective? The German battleship Tirpitz, lying in 163 fleet air arm pilots and observers, many of whom are from Canada, Australia and New Zealand, have been practicing this operation for weeks over a Scottish lock. Then we went on uh, and once again we were practicing in large numbers, as many aircraft as we could get into the air and in a small space over a target at one time. So that once again we were trying to divide the <coughs> anti-aircraft fire that was being brought to bear. And we went to um, a place that I noticed in my logbook, it's called, called Port ZH. And this was in fact an island way in the north of Scotland, 
and the island was uh, the same shape and size as one of the German battleships. And this is what we used as our target for this particular exercise. Now then, the reason for this was that we were practicing for another attack on the German battleship Tirpitz. And we did this and we um, actually dropped live bombs on this island just to get the proper practice in. So the whole squadron, which if I remember rightly was 18 aircraft, was airborne and we were getting in as fast as we could, all 18 aircraft, dropping our bombs and away. And uh, <coughs> it looked and sounded very impressive, I must say. We would dive as near vertical as you can imagine as possible, which was one of the great things about a Barracuda, apart from the wings falling off, uh, it would dive fairly near the vertical. Um, as the, in the open formation, I can't quote actual distances to you, but uh, the, the other aircraft on your starboard side or your port side would be at least four or five wing lengths away from you, so you're not in a close, close formation. But even so, uh, when you're pulling out at the bottom of the dive, that can be fairly, uh, fairly uh, nerve-wracking. During this period, we only lost, I say only, we lost two aircraft crashing into each other at the bottom of one such dive, so we lost six of our chums as a result of that. And that's when you start growing up again, realizing what it's all about. For nearly two years, this pride of Hitler's navy had been lying in Ultum Field, right up near the most northern point of Norway. Last September, in her strongly protected anchorage, some 50 miles up the fjord, she was attacked and severely damaged by British midget submarine. You, you were a bit isolated up there. The only, the only panic we had, they thought Tirpitz was going to come out. And we were going to bomb in all these old aircraft. And I was scared. I mean, it, I, I realized that the hopes of coming back from such a raid, but it never materialized, so it was all right. I mean, uh, we were, I mean, there was no doubt about it. The government and the powers that be were frightened of these German battleships. And, uh, we took a, a convoy through to Russia as the outside. We had a, a heavy fleet, which was well off. Then you had close escorts with the convoy. We were there for fear anything happened from turpits or any of these bigger things, which it didn't. We, we'd stay clear of the convoy. Just the aircraft would go and we'd fly ahead of them. We'd go, we'd, we'd try and keep, you had to keep ahead because they were a bit trigger happy and I don't blame them either. But if you got too near a convoy, it's quite liable to open fire on you because uh, their aircraft recognition wasn't too good and uh, they'd taken a hell of a pasting. So you kept kind of 15, 25 miles ahead of them if you could. And then the next time we went up, we did the bombing on the turpits. We were required to fly up to the Orkneys. And then we were told we were flying onto HMS Formidable, um, which had been at sea for quite a long time. Uh, and that uh, we were to carry out submarine patrols when she was going up Norway, yet again, um, doing a long distance uh, escort of one of the, the, the convoys going up to Russia. So that's the story we were told. In the event, we no sooner been on board than we were all required to muster in, in the operations room where we were told we were going to attack the turpits.
before dawn on this lovely calm April morning, two strikes, each of 21 Barracuda bombers and 40 fighters, take off, form up, and head for the Norwegian mountains. The whole of our effort was diverted to attacking the Tirpitz. And we were split up into two wings. There was 829 and 831 were one wing, and 825 and 827 were the other wing. And we were operating from uh, Furious uh, and Victorious, and we had some baby carriers which were carrying fighters. And the whole thing was tremendously well organised and tremendously well covered. And they had there a model of um, Alton Fjord, where the Tirpitz was, and a lot of information about the situation on the Tirpitz. So we were required to absorb all this and as much information as they could give us. Um, at that stage we didn't think that we were going to be actually involved in the bombing the turbots we were there essentially to do the the, the anti-submarine patrols but in the event come the day we asked if we could go on the turbots mission so a few of us in the squadron were allowed to go along and the 825 827 flew off first and we flew off. As I say, that was taking about five o'clock in the morning. And we flew off about six. We were armed. Some of them were armed with 1,600-pound semi-armor-piercing bombs, which were slung on the torpedo crutch underneath. Some of them were armed with 600-pound mines, and some of them were armed. I was armed with three 500 semi-armor-piercing bombs under the wings. And we're all dive-bombing. Well, we, we, we were gathered in the um, operations room again and um, uh, told um, what we were going to do, um, which essentially was as soon as we took off to stay at a very, very low level, virtually at sea level, and to stay there until a certain point, a certain distance from, from the shore. They converge on Alton Fjord, the Turpitz is getting underway. She is sailing for her first sea trials after damage caused by British midget submarines the previous September. Only idiots fly off uh, aircraft carriers and aeroplanes. For goodness sake, what a silly thing to do. Should have known better. If you're rolling down the deck to take off, invariably you're going to dip down towards the sea when you get to the other end of the, the, the flight deck. And that's a little bit, um, makes your stomach go up and down a little bit, I can assure you. It's never a guarantee that you actually get off the deck. And if you don't, as happened to many friends, many people, 
um, if you go in, into the drink, then what happens is that you bounce, you go underneath the water, and you bounce down the side of the ship. And if you're very unlucky, you get sucked into the screws at the back. So the secret was to get out as quickly as you possibly could. But in those waters, um, which are so cold in Norwegian waters, you don't survive very long anyway. Um, but thank God it didn't happen to us, but it happened to some of our friends. Now, once again, in order to get out of the um, close-range anti-aircraft fire, we aimed to be over the target at 12,000 feet. Now, barracudas with bombs were very slow in climbing. And to get to 12,000 feet over the target, we had to start climbing about 50 bloody miles away. So needless to say, the Germans had lots of notice of our arrival because we actually started climbing over the sea before we reached the Norwegian coast. And the <coughs> Tirpitz was in a fjord called Car Fjord off the Alton Fjord and must have been, I suppose, 30 miles, maybe more inland. So they had plenty of warning of our arrival. Well, you flew off, and, and you flew to a point about five miles out on one of the wings of the fleet, and then you just formed up into your squadrons, one squadron behind the other. In There were nine aircraft in each squadron, supposed to be, so you had three threes, three subflights, and then three subflights flew behind them. We thought we would be attacked by fighters, and we were covered by martlets close to, by Hellcats and Corsairs up above. Terrific fighter cover, and then no fighters ever came up. I was only on one uh, all the time I was uh, operating, that was the Indefatigable. We would take off in the ship and head towards the Norwegian coast at something like 50 to 100 feet high. And as we approached the coast, we would try and avoid the radar as long as we could. And um, when we approached the coast, we would climb as fast as we could up to our operating height, which was 10, 12, 15,000 feet. And then we would um, come down and bomb where we thought she was, but she was always covered with smoke. As soon as we, we lit, um, went over the coast, the Germans lit these smoke cannons. We, we never saw her. We just bombed into the smoke. We had uh, fighter aircraft who were intended to keep the um, light anti-aircraft fire to a minimum, and they were flying round the sort of outskirts, um, firing at what anything moved, virtually. And um, again, you see there were, I'm not certain, but there must have been 36 or 40 barracudas, and we attacked as fast as we could. So at the time, there were a lot of aircraft around us. Now, on this occasion, I was flying with a 1,600-pound bomb, just the one armour-piercing bomb. And the brief for me was to drop the bomb at the maximum speed I could raise, at 4,000 feet, so that the bomb would reach its terminal velocity before it struck the ship, so that it would get the maximum amount of penetration. Without any warning, the British planes suddenly appear from all directions. Surprise is complete. Timing immaculate. Fourteen bomb hits cause complete confusion. 122 dead, 316 wounded, including the captain. All is over in one minute. Only one barracuda is shot down. Back goes the turpits onto the lame duck list. It was clear. It was a beautiful day, and Norway was still snow-covered. Well, we came in on the second attack. 
the first one got some really good hits on it. And the terrible thing was the the mines. They, the, when the mines dropped, they really cleared down all personnel because they fragmented and they were just like shrapnel. The first 1,600 pounder was reputed to have gone down a funnel. I don't know whether it did, but she certainly made a mess of her. I remember this heavy ak ak. It's the first time I'd ever seen it from that point of view. And uh, it was beautiful. It was black, greasy flowers, you might call it. And the idea was, if they put a shell up, you turned in towards it on the assumption that they would correct and you be where you weren't. And that worked. And then we had to, in subflights, uh, just dive down through the smoke to bomb the turbines. And needless to say, there was a lot of flak coming up. Strange thing, flak, it just floats up like onions, up very slowly. You know, it's going at a terrific speed, but it, in actual fact, it's very lazy and it just comes up. Oh, everything, obviously, at you, you think. So that's what we did. We just, or Doug did, them put the nose down and just dive down through the smoke, hoping that we were aiming in the right direction. Um, the scary part was pulling out of the dive at the bottom because you were in the smoke, you were surrounded by mountains, you had all these other aircraft dashing around in this thick smoke, and you had to pull out with a lot of G because you'd just come down vertically vert from 12,000 feet. You had to pull out and uh, somehow get out of this fjord without hitting the mountains and then steer your way back to, to the carrier, which we did individually. A bit of navigation came in at that point in time. The whole of the fjord was filled with smoke and we couldn't pick out the target at all. So we flew over that and uh, the leader decided that it was a waste of time dropping the bombs. We'd go away and try another day. So we set off and we came back again on the 24th. And uh, once again, I was carrying a 1,600-pound bomb. And once again, unfortunately, the fjord was filled with smoke. But the <coughs> Tirpitz was firing its um, heavy anti-aircraft guns. Now, the heavy anti-aircraft guns are not very accurate when they're aiming at aircraft. So what they aimed to do was to fill a box above the ship with as much high explosives as they could and they just kept firing all the big guns into this box and hoped that we would fly into it. <laughs> well, of course, to get to the dive bombing position, we had to. So uh, it was just a little bit frightening flying in amongst these. But um, once you got into the dive, you just didn't notice them at all. And finally, we saw the turpits. She looked beautiful. She was a beautiful line of a ship. The only thing that worried me, it didn't, I, I wasn't frightened. That was the funny thing. Um, she had a, a close range barrage at about 4,000 feet. And I thought, we'll never get through that. Anyway, Stewie Taylor put the nose down and we went hurtling down. I believe we missed it. I saw three bombs as we pulled out, and two were one side and one was the other. In other words, we missed. But you'd still rattle her up. And uh, not having an accurate aiming point, we just aimed at the flashes of the big guns. So we all went in and dropped our weapons. We've no idea how many hit, but there was some damage done to the ship, enough to stop it from going to sea. So what between the damage done then and the damage done in May, when they had actually got to the ship before the smoke started, and the damage done by the midget submarines, the Tirpitz was not in a fit state to fight.
And so, home to roost, having removed, certainly for a considerable time, the menace of Germany's only serviceable battleship. A well-planned stroke, perfectly executed by the fleet air arm. Oh, there was, a, there was a fair bit of mush coming up away from her. She was well and truly hit. But uh, the, the report afterwards was that they'd lost 400 men. I don't know whether that was true or not. But uh, we pulled out. We were pulling out altogether. Uh, uh, we, we were fired at once more by an ACAC gun. And then... We were just coming out down a fjord and a little German boat opened fire on us. Well, we had, as I say, we had a martlet as close escort. This martlet just went down and let him have four, the martlets had 4.5 machine guns and let him have a dose of that and he shut up very quickly. And we got back to the ship and then I was frightened. So once I had dropped my bomb, I just got down as low on the water as I could and went out through the mouth of the fjord and then down Alton Fjord back to the sea. And that was a lovely ride. <laughs> it was a beautiful day. And the Norwegians were out there waving to us as we went past and we were just um, flying along very low level, enjoying it thoroughly. But once you got away from the area of the uh, battleship, there was no idea of craft fire at all. So it was just uh, low flying and enjoying it. But uh, it was exciting as far as I was concerned, because once again, as a 19-year-old, I thought this was all bloody exciting. And it was too. So it was terribly exciting, very exciting, very scary. Um, as soon as we landed back, you had this boost of excitement, this exhilaration, and you were interviewed immediately, a debriefing, and I'm sure I exaggerated everything because I was so wound up, if you like, partly relief getting back, but essentially because this is what it was all about. This is why we've been training for all this time. This was what the war was all about. And um, so... I'll never forget it. I'd never been frightened. I hadn't very... Once I got back to the ship, I was scared. My stomach muscles tightened up. I don't know why. I felt really scared. And, and, and yet, when we'd gone in, and Akak and everything flying at you, and I noticed this again that whenever I was in action, uh, which I never was to that extent again, I mean, it was just small stuff after that, but I was never frightened till after I was back on the ship again. The only uh, query which I had after it was that um, when the squadrons came back, <coughs> we were all ready with torpedoes to load up with torpedoes. But one of the photographs came back, showed Tirpitz having drifted clear of her nets. So I went in with Lieutenant Commander Baker Faulkner to see the captain, Captain George Phillips, with the idea of loading up again with torpedoes and going in again. And he took this to be a very good idea. And um, we did load up with torpedoes. And he said, uh, providing torps, that was me, you go as well. So I said, OK, fine, I'll go. And uh, then we got, sadly, in my opinion, got a signal saying that um, from 
Vice Admiral Sir John Moore, who was in uh, acting uh, CNC Home Fleet, saying that uh, he considered the Tirpitz to be no, no longer a capital ship. He congratulated everybody else, and everybody home we went. Of course, it wasn't true. Um, one of the reasons that I think why Sir John Moore said no to any further attacks was because he felt they wouldn't get in anyhow because of the smoke. Um, our pilots reckoned that they were so disorganised that probably we could get in. Um, I'd had a quick look at the chart and reckoned that their torpedoes would run, but it, there was a very dicey do because the, each air, the, the aircraft couldn't spread out. They had to come in one after the other. And um, whether it be, um, would have been successful or not, I don't know. Probably be uh, suicidal. So we did some uh, did some re patrols on the way up to the turbots and on the way back from the turbots. Boring, boring, actually, because you'd fly at about whatever three hundred feet for about two and a half hours um, in a position that you a were allocated in relation to the the fleet, um, and uh, you you cover that particular area just looking for submarines or anything that uh, indicated there could be a submarine around, like an oil slip or preferably a periscope. And it could be terribly, terribly dull. Um, we used to pass the time by singing. Uh, it was on this, ex on this particular um, attack, I think it was called Greenwood, I'm not quite certain what it was called, that the nabob uh, was torpedoed and uh, she was, in fact, towed back to... She was a small carrier. She was, in fact, towed back to Scarpa Flow, finally. I was told, whether it's true or not, that the captain was in trouble because he panicked a little bit when she started heeling over and instructed all the parachutes to be thrown into the drinks as, as markers. And he found all the parachutes on his mess bill at the end of the day because it was quite unnecessary. They towed her back to Scarpa Flow. So... So back to Scarpa Flow we went. At sea, Barracuda aircraft returned from an attack on the Tirpitz lying in a Norwegian fjord. And the damage from the giant's ak ak wasn't the only risk run. A plane comes to grief. But though smoke shrouds the cockpit, the pilot is unhurt. The luck of the game. The barracudas had done their best. But for turpits lying in the fjords, something heavier was needed. And that something heavier? 12,000-pound monster bombs known as tall boys. One tall boy to each RAF Lancaster bomber of the famous 617 squadron. Target, turpits. The Tuppets was not in a fit state to fight. So in fact, it didn't leave Car Fjord until some time much later when it was towed down to Tromsø. And when they towed it to Tromsø, I think it was intended to repair it, but they made a mistake because, in fact, they brought it within the range of the RAF heavy bombers. And they were able to go off with the bomb they called Tallboy, which was a 12,000-pound bomb. And uh, they got hits with the 12,000-pound bombs, and that was the end of the Tirpitz. It is fitting, I think, to confess at this stage that um, there are periods when you are an observer sitting in the back as a passenger 
when it's much more nerve nerve wracking and this is the part that's sitting in the front. You are not in control in any sense. So from a, 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 a nerve making viewpoint, it's a pretty twitchy business being an observer. Um, the um, one reason I hate being driven in a car. I hate, hate somebody else driving me in a car. I want to be in control, having spent all those years out of control, if you like, having to put my life in somebody else's hands as far as that's concerned. No, no, as, as one, one has trepidation before you take off, but once, one, once you're in the air, uh, you know, you're busy and uh, you haven't got time to think about how you feel. Uh, you're part of a team that's got to do the job and, uh, as I say, you're busy and fear, such as it was, disappears. But the, I think the, the worst time is the briefing when you realise what the devil is, <laughs> is, coming, is coming your way or might do. Again, it was an adventure because it's the first time we'd we, we'd uh, been operating off an aircraft carrier, and that in itself was a terrific excitement. And I can't Im you can't imagine the thrill, the uniqueness of being in an aircraft and having a responsibility which only two or three other aircraft in the air at the same time share with you looking after the safety of the whole home fleet. And there it is below you. Somewhere I've got a list of all the ships that were there. There are about four aircraft carriers and about two, two or three cruisers and innumerable destroyers, corvettes, the whole lot there, spread over a vast, vast distance. And there you are chugging along at 300 feet. Did I say it was boring? Well, in a way it's boring, but just look down on this site of the home fleet. Um, just unbelievable. But the dive bombing was quite accurate. I mean, our greatest effort was the attack on the Tirpitz. I mean, we spent an awful long time training for it. But we made a really good mess of it. I remember I went to Hamlin and uh, one of the party I was with this, this is not many years ago. He said, there's a chap who'd like to talk to you, Norman. I said, oh, yes. And we went, and this chap said, I hear you you bombed the turbots. I said, yes. He said, and a bloody fine job you made of it, too. He said, I was an engineer officer aboard. But he said, fortunately, he said, I was ashore that day picking up stores. <laughs> he saw it all from the shore. And he saw it all when he got back. With a final tribute to the fleet air arm pilots who made the precarious life of Tirpitz unbearable, we turn to the Lancaster bomber boys of the RAF. Three direct hits by earthquake bombs signed the death warrant of the last big ship Hitler possessed. The ship which never fired a shot in any action at sea. This is the end, not only of the Tirpitz, but of the so-called German high seas fleet. <laughs>